trauma does not happen on a talking or rational level, right? Mm -hmm. It happens to us on a sensory level. We are mostly a sensory being. And so it has to be healed from that level. So you want to you want to be with a trauma therapist who's very experienced with somatic psychology, somatic experiencing, understanding that the trauma energy can be stored, is stored in the body. Maybe someone, a therapist who's been trained in ego state therapy, such as internal family systems or Mm -hmm. EMDR, which is really well known for trauma therapy. And that's the one that I Mm -hmm. integrate my practice as well. Mm -hmm. So... What is complex PTSD and what are the steps I need to take to begin my healing journey? Today, we're going to answer these questions along with more information on trauma healing. Alicia Song is an intuitive trauma therapist and spiritual healing coach. Today, she's going to explain how involving the physical body to heal trauma is key and why acknowledging our pain is the first step to begin our healing journey. So many of us are blocking our emotions and distracting ourselves to get by. So keep listening if you want to learn more about how to sit with your feelings and connect with yourself on a deeper level. Hi, Alicia. How are you? I am well. Thanks, Emily. Absolutely. I'm so excited for our conversation today. Why don't we start off by just hearing who you are and what you do, and we'll start there. Great. Yeah. So my name is Alicia Song. And I am an intuitive trauma therapist here in Washington State and been working with clients in trauma for over 20 years, right around 23 years. And the way that I do trauma therapy is a little unconventional, a little out of the ordinary. And we can talk more about that if you want to. But I also wrote a book that was published last year called uh, Love What Hurts, A Guide for Healing Emotional Wounds and Following Your Intuition. And that intuitive piece um, was really important to me because Mm -hmm. I realized over the years just healing from my own trauma and then also working with people who are healing. Mm -hmm. Intuition is definitely blocked. Being able to trust yourself Mm -hmm. is blocked by all that trauma energy. And what I realized over the years is when the impact of trauma, that trauma energy gets desensitized, neutralized, then it's really a lot easier for folks to access their own inner guidance, that intu- intuitive voice yeah. that can be so powerful if we know how to utilize it. Oh my gosh, yes. I resonate on all the levels. So could you like define what complex PTSD is? So complex PTSD, it's not an official diagnosis. How it's described is some prolonged and repetitive trauma that's going on for a person. So for a child who is repeatedly getting abused by a family member, that would be complex trauma, Mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't have to be that dramatic. It doesn't have to be abuse or sexual assault. It can be um, something as subtle as a child, you know, growing up in a home where they're getting messages that they're not good enough. And I would call that complex PTSD to the brain, definitely. Like it's a, it's an injury to the development, to the healthy development of that child. Mm -hmm. So they may not be getting abused or anything like that but if they grow right if they grow up with that message Mm -hmm. then they go into adulthood into adult relationships the work environment and what have you feeling not good enough right feeling like they'll never be worthy and I think that's what we're seeing more and more is like this emotional neglect and needs Mm -hmm. not being met throughout childhood and those you know deeper attachment wounds and now that's starting to come up a lot more in adulthood. And like you said, there's a block between the mind and the body connecting and we're not being able to, you know, access that, that intuition. When someone decides that they want to start this healing journey and start healing from their trauma, where is a good place for them to start? If it feels overwhelming, like they feel too, like trauma therapy, maybe with a professional therapist, maybe that feels too daunting or too scary then really like they could start with a book like mine, Love What Hurts, because 
what the book does, it's very user friendly. You can use it whether you've had trauma therapy or you're in the middle of trauma therapy or you've done your own therapy already. But it really is about learning how to get comfortable with the energy that's still lit, the trauma energy that's still living in your body, in Mm -hmm. your senses, Mm -hmm. in your emotions, and your thoughts. So once we get comfortable, Comfortable might even be pushing it a little bit. But once we can acknowledge those wounded parts of us, then the tra- that's the trailhead to healing. Mm. Then the healing journey isn't quite as daunting. But overall, I would always recommend someone, if they're ready, and you know they've, they've done the book, they've read the self-help books, or they've done a bunch of talk therapy, or not. They just feel like, okay, this is a good time in my life and I need to do this. This has been nagging at me for years and I'm finally ready. Definitely seek out a professional trauma therapist that doesn't just do talk therapy. Like there's plenty of therapists out there who call themselves trauma therapists, but they're just talking about client's trauma and talking about client's feelings about that trauma. Right. Yeah, but trauma does not happen on a talking or rational level, right? Mm -hmm. It happens to us. On a sensory level, we are mostly a sensory being, and so it has to be healed from that level. So you want to you wanna be with a trauma therapist who's very experienced with somatic um, psychology, somatic experiencing, understanding that the trauma energy can be stored, is stored in the body. Um, maybe someone, a therapist who's been trained in ego state therapy, such as internal family systems or Mm -hmm. EMDR, which is really well known for trauma therapy. And that's the one that I Mm -hmm. integrate my practice as well. Mm So that that would be my advice. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's absolutely wonderful advice. And I think I like what you said, you know, kind of taking it slow, like maybe if this is a new journey, just starting it kind of on your own before you invite another person to be in the room with you. And then once you kind of start to feel a little more comfortable to where you can talk about these things, then seek out a trauma-informed therapist. So what are some signs that someone is dealing with this trauma? Because I feel like for many people, they just don't even know the things that they've experienced are blocking them. Yeah. So the signs can be hard, but what I look for are patterns. So do you have a pattern of overreacting to things that really, when you step back and look at it from your rational brain, didn't really need such a strong reaction? Is there a pattern of that? Is there a pattern happening with your most important relationships where you feel not heard, not seen, where, again, you're overreacting or you're taking things personally, everything personally? So. That's what, if, if you don't know, and then there's, there could be physical symptoms like weird physical illnesses that, you know, you go to the doctor, you get labs done and what have you, and nothing comes up as abnormal. Mm-hmm. And so then you want to, if, and if that's a chronic condition, then that's usually to me, that's when it's like a little bit of a red flag and like, oh, okay, let me sit with this because it can tell me something. So sometimes, uh, like in my book, I talk about plantar fasciitis in my right foot that I struggled with for two years. And I went to all the doctors and all the alternative healers mm-hmm. as well. And um, that wasn't working for me. And then when I realized that pain was connected to an old wounding between my mother and I, then it that was like, it made me feel empowered that I could actually heal it. And I did. I was able to heal it with, you know, the help of an energy healer and some a really good friend of mine. So pay attention to patterns and mm-hmm. chronic like physical ailments that keep mm-hmm. coming up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, another part of patterns is, you know, who do you choose as your friends? Do you tend to choose people or partners, right? Boyfriends, mm-hmm. girlfriends, partners. Who are you choosing? You know, are those relationships good relationships? And what's the pattern there? Do you keep choosing someone that you need to fix? You know, and sometimes we do that because that makes us feel worthy, right? Do you keep choosing narcissists? Do you keep choosing addicts? Are you an addict? So looking for those kind of um, dysfunctional patterns 
would be a, a yeah a sign a sign yeah. yeah no absolutely definitely and something I like frequently bring up in my sessions is we go towards love that's familiar not love that's healthy and right. we typically like play out those patterns which is unfortunate but mm -hmm. our brain wants us to be comfortable and that means familiar not good right. so have to do something different which is going to be even more weird but it will be helpful in the long run going back to starting to heal that trauma and working through that the physical body is a huge part of this like you said talk therapy isn't going to really fully you know do the job you might get some psycho ed you might get some insight but there is a mind and body connection here there is an energy connection here so can you kind of explain what that process looks like to help someone get connected with their gut. Yeah, yeah. So we have to set aside time to get quiet. We have to do that. So if if all you have are 5 minutes in a day, take those 5 minutes, be in a room or sorry, somewhere where you're not going to be interrupted for 5 minutes and just do some just follow your breath. So that would be like the very beginning, just following that breath. You don't have to create a breathing rhythm. Just notice the breath. So that's how mindfulness starts to begin. Mm. Getting comfortable with going, getting quiet. We re it really is necessary to the healing mm -hmm. process. Because what we're doing, um, and the pandemic showed us this, right? Like we have all the things that keep us distracted and stimulated. Mm -hmm. and so we can avoid quiet. So that's mm -hmm. the conundrum. People with PTSD, complex PTSD, they avoid the quiet times because, quote unquote, they don't want to deal with their inner demons, you know? So that's why I say five minutes and just follow the breath. Notice, even in those five minutes, if those inner demons come raging in loudly, what I would suggest, this is really hard to do, but it can be very powerful, is you acknowledge those voices, those thoughts, like, okay, thank you for letting me know this is how you feel. So again, that goes back to recognizing all the parts. Those are the wounded parts trying to talk to us, trying to get our attention. And they might do it in really mean, crazy, scary ways. Mm -hmm. But if we can step just a little bit outside and not be in the experience, right, and just acknowledge like, okay, thank you you for being here. Thank you for making yourself known. Write it down, kind of a thing, and then go back to noticing your breathing. So that takes some practice to do that because most of us are trying to avoid. But really, mindfulness is not trying to erase those thoughts. That's impossible. It's really sort of welcoming those thoughts in a separate way, understanding that I am not my thoughts, separate from those thoughts thoughts are based on yeah traumatic experiences yes does that make sense yeah no it totally makes sense like acknowledging that they're there because we're never going to be able to erase our memory and it's never going to go away mm -hmm. but being able to talk ourselves through it of like I'm safe I'm okay I know that you know that inner demon or that inner child or you might want to give it a name like it's there mm -hmm. and I feel it but it's okay and I'm in a safe place now. And so mm -hmm. we're kind of in a way learning how to handle it. We're not getting rid of it, but we're we're managing it. Mm -hmm. Um and I think that goes back to like what you said earlier about like neutralizing the pain of those blocking beliefs. Like again, we're not getting rid of it, but we're neutralizing it. We're mm -hmm. taking the power away from those thoughts, those memories, those traumatic situations. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And Another more pleasant way of getting quiet and getting more comfortable with quiet is, of course, it's, this is another exercise from my book, but it's one that I use all the time with clients, is imagining place you've been to. It could be real. It could be fake and imaginary. But allowing yourself through your imagination to pretend that you're in that place and using all of your senses, your tactile vision, sound, smell to really re-experience that place in your imagination. And that can have a nice calming effect for folks. And then it's not mm -hmm. so scary to get mm -hmm. quiet and to get into the felt sense of the body and your emotions. It sounds like mindfulness is a huge part of this process. Yeah. 
It is. And I think a lot of people believe if they meditate, if they're mindful, then they don't have any of that negativity going on. But that's truly not the definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness is just being aware of what's going on (laughs) internally, externally, you know. Sitting with those feelings. And I feel like today in society with us, you know, over consuming media and always distracting ourselves and always being on the go, it can be incredibly hard to find time to sit down and be mindful. And many of us use, including myself, social media, TikTok, and our cell phones to distract ourselves and to numb ourselves from the pain. And it's so common that we don't really see that as like a red flag. Like you are trying to desensitize yourself right now from feeling your feelings because it's just so normal. Right. It is. However, you know, if you are on your phone, you can download a gratitude app. And you can track your gratitude. You can do gratitude journaling that way. Mm -hmm. So there are like healthy apps that we can download Mm -hmm. onto our phone to get us, help us like sort of transition away from the screen time. So that's what I did many years ago. I was like, I wanted to start a gratitude practice every day. So I first started to sit outside every morning, well, during the summer and with my cup of coffee and then just go through my phone and do my normal thing, but then go to the gratitude app. And eventually I just organically just shifted to away from the phone and created a gratitude journal and then created, created a more like morning practice before I start the day of, you know, quiet time, meditation, journaling. Journaling is a great way to, if you don't feel like you can just sit there and just, you know, breathe and meditate, Journaling can also be another meditative practice. The book, uh, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, written like in the early 90s, I think 92 or something, maybe 1990. Um, She has a a protocol of what to do every day, what to do once a week and what have you to sort of get those creative juices flowing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you could do every day, this comes from her book, are morning pages, where as soon as you wake up, and maybe you make your cup of coffee, you sit down and you write down with pen and paper, not not on a computer, three pages just sort of dumping whatever's in your mind. And mm-hmm. it might not make any sense. It's not supposed to. And I did that for a little while, maybe like a month or two I did that. Mm-hmm. And what I found was it was kind of like the equivalent of sort of decluttering and clearing out the mm-hmm. cobwebs. Mm-hmm. And then I just felt like I was starting the day with with more of a clear mind. Mm-hmm. So practices like that can, can sort of sort of help us transition to a place where we get comfortable getting quiet. I actually yeah. now look, look forward to my morning meditation. Before it was a little bit like, oh, I guess I got to do this thing. I know it's healthy for me, you know, kind of like going to the gym, right? Or working out like, oh, I got to go. But then after a while, if you're having fun and you're getting benefits from it, you look mm-hmm. forward to that time to yourself when everyone else is, you know, wanting you and, you know, grabbing at you and needing yeah. your attention, you know, that this is, this is your time. It's pretty precious. Yeah, absolutely. I think a big takeaway there is that healing takes time and it really does, you know, fall on to us to follow through with these practices and just going to therapy and talking about these things is just one piece of it, but actually doing yeah. the work, waking up, doing the journaling, doing the gratitude, showing up for yourself, like you said, going to the gym, like it's not fun, but you're going to feel good after. And Mm -hmm. so just doing these practices, even if you don't trust it, even if you don't know if it's going to make you feel better, but just letting that process happen. And then again, once you see those benefits, you start feeling more clear, you start, you know, having a more regulated nervous system, you start getting in tune with your gut and your intuition. And it's like, okay, this is what it feels like. It's almost like, Because I've had, you know, my own journey and starting to be more connected with myself. I felt like I grew into my body. It was almost like I was like a little person wearing big clothes. That's like the best way I could explain it. I felt like there was an adult version of me and sometimes she would be there. But then a lot of the times like little Emily was there. And so then getting more connected and working through my stuff. Like one day I just like I felt like I grew into myself. It was just the most weird experience. And I went up to my teacher and I was like, I think I can, like my gut, like it's talking to me. Like I feel things differently. I can feel different energy from, you know, people. And so it's such 
a rewarding and amazing experience, but it does take a lot of of work, essentially, outside of yes. therapy. Yes, I agreed. Yeah, exactly. And I and I love that. See, what happened was you integrated the little girl into the adult woman, mm-hmm. and and that is the ultimate goal of any kind of healing journey, I believe. But mm-hmm. well, and trauma, especially because we we tend to split off, right? into different ego states, we might not even be aware that there is a little person still living with within us. And that right. person might actually be causing some problems in our adult lives, right? Absolutely. So yeah. we have we have to acknowledge those parts of us and like you said, grow into being grow into the adult you are. That's what you yeah. did. You integrated yeah. those part that part of you. That's beautiful. I love yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah. It mm-hmm. it's been such a journey. And so you know, going back to like, you know, the little versions of ourselves, or, um, you know, the parts of ourself that are blocking memories, or we're not being able to connect fully. I, I know that part of that is our brain trying to protect us and disassociating and distracting, you know, we're trying to protect ourselves from feeling that pain. And so could you maybe talk about how part of that is helpful, but then it gets to a part where it's not, it's not helping us anymore. Right. So it was helpful when we were younger. Those coping mechanisms began when the trauma started happening. So usually it began really early in life, most likely before adolescence. And it was a way for our brilliant minds to protect us, to have us believe that things are actually better than they are for our own survival, our own emotional and sometimes physical survival. So it's great through that time period when the trauma is actually chronic and happening, but then we grow up, we're away from the trauma, but we're still dissociating, we're still distracted. So how it can show up in a problematic way is just not being aware. It can be just as mild as that, just not being aware of how you're coming across, not being aware of the patterns, the dysfunctional patterns that are happening. Right. Like you said earlier, we tend to pick partners and friendships based on a familiar feeling from childhood. And that feeling gives us a sense of safety, although it's false safety. Right. Mm -hmm. But because of this, the level of dissociation, whether it's mild or extreme, we're still going to keep reaching for that familiar feeling. Mm -hmm. And so then it becomes a problem because then we, we, we keep picking partners who aren't good for us. Mm-hmm. We keep picking friends who aren't, you know, encouraging or supportive at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just keep repeating the childhood dynamic, the, that um, trauma dynamic, so mm-hmm. to speak. That's when it's a problem. <laughs> of course, I do believe in like intentional distractions sometimes. And that's where we might need to just take a break. Because we can, we know that we're being triggered, like, ooh, but you don't have time to really sit long in meditation to figure out why you were triggered. Mm-hmm. So there can be a very intentional dissociative mm-hmm. exercise that we can do, like thinking about that place that makes us feel, you know, calm and safe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so those kinds of distractions can be healthy if we're doing them with intention. Yeah, that's a great way to to phrase it, like being mindful about it. You Mm -hmm. know that you're going to work and you get triggered. Maybe this is a good time to have a healthy distraction or a mindfulness practice, knowing that these feelings are there. I can't fully feel them right now because I can't I can't Mm -hmm. lose it. But let me keep it together, do what I need to do, and almost like set aside time. Okay, when I get home today, I'm gonna sit by myself and journal and write about my feelings and, and let myself process what was coming up for me. But right now, I just I just can't do it. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. And so something that I hear often is like, you know, we're on this healing journey and we can just get so caught up in fixing and fixing and fixing and working Mm. and we're human and like we're never going to like get to the end of the race. And so what is like a better way to to think about, you know, working through this healing journey, but also like you are okay just the way you are and there's not a perfect image of yourself that you're trying to reach. Right. It is tricky. And um, I think especially in a society where we're very goal-oriented, 
right? That it becomes just another goal to heal from my trauma and for me to be a better person. And you're right. Like we are already a good person. We're already mm-hmm. good in that, but we're healing those woundings. So it's kind of like a child, you know, running up to you after they've fallen down on, on asphalt on the playground and they skin their knee. Like you don't look at them as a bad person because they're hurting, right? You want to help them so that they can feel better and go play again. Mm -hmm. So for, you know, helping that child feel better is not fixing that child. We're fixing the wound. We're fixing the impact of that wounding. But the child was whole and perfect and wonderful to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that analogy, like if that works for you, but does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, because we feel so much pressure to fix ourselves. Maybe it's not like ourselves that we're trying to fix. Maybe there's just like, like we said, like little parts and injuries and wounds that we need to kind of Mm -hmm. mend and heal. But the Mm -hmm. person itself is still worthy of love and is Mm -hmm. okay. Because I think that's where things get dicey is when people, even loved ones wanting to help their friends and their family who struggle with mental illness and diagnosing and, and things like that. And wanting to help them, but then it can kind of feel like, is something wrong with me? Like, am I not enough just how I am? Right. The answer, of course, is no, nothing's wrong with you, but you're experiencing a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to help you with, is the pain of not feeling like you're good enough, Mm -hmm. not feeling you're, not feeling like you're, you know, worthy enough. That's, Mm -hmm. that's what I want to repair those thoughts and those beliefs, but I don't want to repair a person. The person, I already see the person as whole, you know, so. Yeah, that's, I think that takes the pressure off again of like people Mm -hmm. constantly wanting to fix and change and grow. It can get exhausting sometimes. Yeah. So I like that, that reframe. That's, that's super helpful. It can get exhausting for sure. And that's, I also encourage people doing um, stuff with their bodies. So move your body in, a, in fun ways, have fun in between your therapy sessions, mm-hmm. allow yourself to have fun on the healing journey, not mm-hmm. about, not about the trauma, mm-hmm. but like, you know, if you are a hiker, go hike, you know, if you want to get into painting, that's a lovely supplement to the healing journey that the mm-hmm. creative, playful juices going can help you feel more balanced mm-hmm. and less exhausted. And I always and I always um, recommend any kind of body healing too, or energy healing. So if you have a favorite Reiki practitioner or massage therapy, acupuncture, lymph- lymphatic massage, you know all of these things that are directly, you know, healing the body. So that's a great way to balance the mental and emotional exhaustion that can come from uh, the healing journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And something I've heard too is like trying to get it out of you. And so like creating a super helpful writing songs and painting and drawing and movement, dancing to like, almost like pull the negative energy out. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. Amazing. Is there anything else that you think we should add to this discussion? I feel like we covered a good amount of content. Yeah, no. Yeah. I'm, it feels, feels complete. Yeah, it feels good. Yeah. We feel whole. We feel, we're yeah. Whole. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Great question, well, thank Emily. You so much. Oh my gosh, <laughs> thanks. Um, it's been so great. Well, thank you so much, Leisha. Will you tell us where we can find your book? Well, you can find it at any online retailer, book retailer. So Amazon's the easiest. Yeah, so that's where you can find my book. Amazing. And mm-hmm. did you want to tell us your website as well? If people yeah. Are yeah, so I'm in Washington State. And uh, my website is Sacred Healing Place Tacoma. That's the city I'm in. dot com. That's awesome. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook under Sacred Healing Place as well. So, are you seeing just individuals, or do you see couples and families as well? Oh, I just see individuals. Yeah. Okay. So o- older teens all the way through adulthood. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, it was wonderful meeting with you and getting a chance to pick your brain. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Emily. Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for spending some time with us here on a safe place to land. 
Could you do me a favor really quick? Could you leave us a review wherever you are listening to this and subscribe so that you never have to miss an episode whenever we drop it? If at any point in time you're like, man, it would be so cool to work with the team at Sunshine City Counseling, you can always find us at sunshinecitycounseling.com. We serve the state of Florida and we are located in the downtown community of St. Petersburg, Florida. If you are in or around the Portland, Maine area, you can find us at easternshorecounseling.co. We really believe that every single person is deserving of excellent mental health care. You are not a problem to be solved or fixed. You are a person to be served. We are here for you, so don't hesitate to reach out. Until next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye.